want to thank the kids. Um, some of the other kids uh, are going to be up during the last song, and uh, but you have to stand for that. Uh, it's, you, you couldn't sit for it anyway. It's um, one of those songs that gets you up and gets you moving. I want to remind you where we're at because we actually are going uh, backwards today. Um, back on August the 11th, I preached from um, Luke the 6th chapter, verses 43 through 45. And uh, so the next week you expected me to do Luke uh, 46, and I jumped to chapter 7. And so some of you said, well, why are you doing that? Are we not going to do 46 through 49 that ends that chapter? And I said, oh, yeah, we're coming back to it. But we camped in chapter 7 for the last three weeks. So now we're going back, and we're going to pick up on these verses that end chapter 6. And not only in this chapter but it also ends the Sermon on the Mount as recorded in Luke's Gospel. If you remember at the start of the Sermon on the Mount, in verse 20, it says that Jesus turned his gaze to his disciples. Turned his gaze to his disciples. And so now we come to the end of this particular sermon that Jesus is giving on the plain there on the side of the mountain outside of Capernaum. And so this morning I'll be looking at verses 46 through 49. And these go along with our theme of the weekend, rock solid. So if you have your Bibles and want to follow along, Luke 6, beginning with verse 46. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? Everyone who comes to me and hears my words and acts on them, I will show you whom he is like. He is like a man building a house who dug deep and laid a foundation on the rock. And when the floods occurred and the torrents burst against that house, and could not shake it because it had been built well built. But the one who has heard and has not acted accordingly is like a man who built a house on the ground without any foundation, and the torrents burst against it, and immediately it collapsed, and the ruin of that house was great. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable and pleasing in your sight, for you are our strength and our Redeemer. Illuminate our hearts this morning, Father, for what you would have for us as this passage unfolds. We pray this in your name. Amen. Hurricane Ike rolled through Galveston, Texas in September of 2008, and it was considered at that time one of the costliest, uh, it's actually the third costliest hurricane Um, in all of the United States history. And at that time, it was the most costly hurricane ever to roll through Texas. And so following the days, just like we have seen with um, uh, Doreen, who's come through our state over this past week, you see all of these photos of the aftermath that has happened where tornadoes have gone through or Ocracoke and Hatteras where a number of families have lost homes. Well, those pictures are very common and it happened during Hurricane Ike. On the peninsula in Galveston, Texas, there were some 200 homes. But ironically, after Hurricane Ike went through, there was one home that got attention. It was photographed more than any other home, shown on more TV screens than any other house of the time. In fact, it was the only house that was standing. And such that people believed that it was photoshopped in to the landscape. Until CNN, Fox News, and a particular wildlife um, ranger actually verified the houses there. I want you to see a picture of this. This is the peninsula in Galveston. The end of the peninsula is in the the, the far scenes there. 
this is the house. This is really a house on this peninsula. The other next picture is a little closer up, and you can see the devastation. Some 200 homes were on this peninsula around this house. The next one will show the backside. Now, it looks like a bigger house, but this, the picture actually is stretched out here. Uh, I could have narrowed it down, but it, so it looks like the back of the house. But this is from the other direction. So you see, going the other direction from the house, there are no standing houses. Interesting. Aaron Reed, a spokesperson for the Texas Park and Wildlife Commission, confirmed that this house, the Adams House, Warren and Pam Adams were the owners of this house, and theirs was the only one left standing on the Gulf Beach side there in Galveston. Reed said, as I saw and walked around this house, I decided to decide if I'm ever going to build a house on the beach, I'm going to get this contractor to build my house. I think he would have been pretty smart about that. Jesus, in this Sermon on the Mount, as he's finishing up, gives illustrations for us of good and bad builders, or in other words, obedient or disobedient disciples. So in verse 46, he begins this section after he has been teaching, and he says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, when you do not do what I say? Now, we know that he's attracted a lot of followers. We know that they, uh, from uh, the accounts, there are great numbers of people. Even Luke tells us that people from uh, Judea, from Jerusalem, from Tyre and Sidon, the coastal communities there, had gathered around. Doesn't give us a number, but we know there's hundreds, if not thousands, that had followed him at this point that would be listening to Jesus and even some calling him Lord. The Greek word for Lord is kurus. And it's used in a couple of different ways. One of the ways that it is used is as a title of respect or in referring to someone that you are calling. So example, you go into a restaurant and you're trying to get the attention of your waiter and you say, hey, sir. Well, that sir would be the same in the Greek as, hey, Lord. But in this context, what it's being used for is the other definition, which is supreme in authority. Now, you look at the monarchy in England, and you often will hear Lord William or Lord this, or you hear a, a Lord in their last name within the monarchy. Um, and so it is a, 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 a term of authority. And so here, when Jesus says, you call me Lord, Lord, and they are giving him the do as far as the authority, even some respect, maybe even those that are believing maybe in his deity, but there are those who are affirming his authority but yet not submitting to him as Lord. There's the parallel passage um, in Matthew's gospel to this text and prior to the illustration that Matthew gives us, gives us an understanding of verse 46. I want you to hear what Matthew says in 7, Matthew 7, verse 21 through 23. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does my will, the will of my Father who is in heaven, will enter. Many of you will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not cast out demons did, in your name? Did we not in your name perform uh, miracles? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. They wanted, they wanted Jesus to be their Savior but they were not willing to submit to his lordship. Jesus says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do 
not do what I tell you. If you don't hear anything else this morning, maybe this is one of those sentences you need to kind of put to your memory. Submission to the Lord Jesus Christ, or let me put it this way, submission to Jesus Christ as Lord is a non-negotiable element of true salvation. I want to say that again. Submission to the Lord or to Jesus Christ as Lord is a non-negotiable element of true salvation. Romans 9.10 says it this way, If you confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Saving faith comes with obedient faith. Acts 6-7 relates to us that during this early church movement that took place, that many of the priests came to faith, it says they came to obedient faith in the Lord. The Hebrew writer in 5-9 tells us this, Jesus is to those who obey him, the source of eternal salvation. When you come to faith in Jesus Christ, there is a submission to the Lordship that takes place. Jesus says, those who hear my word and obey it. So in the next verse, he says, everyone who comes to me and hears my word and acts on it, I will show you whom he or she is like. And he gives us two illustrations here. He gives us an illustration of the good builder and a bad builder, or that that is an obedient disciple to Jesus Christ, one who submits to Christ, or one who is disobedient and does not. It's helpful here, I think, for us to remember that Jesus was a carpenter. His dad was a carpenter. And so Jesus had spent his life uh, up until he went into the ministry at 30 uh, with his dad, he would know what it means to build. In fact, we often think of a carpenter as one who only deals with wood. In this time, a carpenter not only dealt with wood, but they dealt with stone. And so here you have someone that would be as today, like our general contractor, able to do it all. If you called Jesus prior to his ministry as a carpenter to come to your house, he could have done it all. And so he's giving this illustration, undoubtedly, coming from some personal experience that he had. He could tell us what a firm foundation is. And so he begins in 48. The good builder is like a man building a house who dug deep and laid a foundation and I love this term, own the rock, own the rock. Here is a man, Jesus says, that wants to go the extra mile, is willing to take the extra time, is willing to dig deep to find the rock to place his foundation on. Whatever it took, he was willing to do that. The extra effort to make sure the foundation was firm and on the rock. The Adams house in Galveston, Texas, along the shore, had been built firm on the rock. It withstood the winds of time that day as Hurricane Ike came through. And when we build our house on the rock, when we go beyond the surface and build our house, then when the floods rise and the storms come, when the waves beat against us in life, we will not be shaken, as we sung a little bit earlier. Our house, our spiritual house, will stand firm. It's well built, Jesus says, and it cannot be shaken. And then Jesus describes the other builder, this person who he terms has been in disobedient, has not heard the word, has not acted on this word. 
And he says, this man built his house on the ground without any foundation. Now, if you have ever built anything on the ground without a foundation and a storm has arose and it was not anchored down in any way, what happens to it? It blows away or falls down or it crashes. And so this man was not willing to take the time. This man was not willing to take the effort or to invest in the cost that it took to have a firm foundation. And what happens is that the house falls to the ground. In fact, Jesus says that the house is in ruins, in great ruins. Now, 200 houses was around the Adam's house there. And evidently, at least some of their foundations certainly were not on the rock because as you looked at those pictures, there was not another single house that had stood tall in the winds of Hurricane Ike. Here's the thing. You can have a house built on the ground with no foundation. You can have a house built on the rock, a firm foundation. And you can look at those two houses, and from the outside, those houses look just alike. They're very similar. In fact, they could be built so that they do look alike. The siding's alike, the windows are alike, the doors are alike, the color's alike, the roof is alike. They look just the same from the outside. But you can't see under the ground. You can't see that foundation, what it's built on. And then when the winds come, that outward appearance is no longer significant. It doesn't matter what the color is. It doesn't matter what it looks like or the similarities. When the storms break against it, what will happen? In fair weather, they're good to go. But in stormy weather, one of the houses will not fare well if it's not on a firm foundation. Jesus says this house will fall immediately. This house will fail. Of course, he's talking about our spiritual life. He's given an illustration about how we come to faith and how we build our faith on the rock, which is Jesus Christ. He is the cornerstone of our faith. He is the one that we build on. He is the solid rock. He is the bedstone. So Jesus gives these two illustrations to show whether we see ourselves as obedient or do we see ourselves as disobedient. How will we stand against the times? How will we stand when the storms come in life, and they will come. The question is, where have we put our foundation? If we are obedient to the Lord and we make him our cornerstone, then this verse that says that they will do, there will be some type of action, obedience in our life to the Lord. You say, well, that sounds like works righteousness to me. Well, let me clarify. It is not works righteousness. You can go to Paul's letter to, uh, to Rome, the verse, or chapters 3 through 6, and see that uh, faith is in Christ alone, uh, not by works. You will see righteousness is imputed as a gift. You will see that you cannot earn it. You cannot be good enough to earn salvation. You only receive it. Romans 3.22 says the righteousness of God is manifested through faith in Jesus Christ for all those who believe. And then you jump to verse 24 and he says, being justified is a gift by grace through the redemption which only comes through who? Jesus Christ. James tells us, even so, faith, if it has no works, is dead. 
James 2.17. And so you see, we come to faith in Jesus Christ. Our salvation is securing him. But Jesus says, if you're going to call me Lord and you're going to live into the lordship that I have over you, if you're going to be a disciple of mine, there's going to be some action in your life. Because if there's no action, then your faith is dead. Faith without works is dead. So Jesus, in verse 47, says, Everyone who comes and hears my word does them. And he gives these illustrations. In other words, there is action. The Apostle John tells us in the second chapter, as we look at this letter, in verses 3 and 4, he says, By this they will know that we have come to know him if we, can, we keep his commandments. And then this is what he says in verse 4. The one who says, I have come to know him, Jesus Christ, and does not keep his commandments, is a liar. And the truth is not in them. The truth is not in them. Jesus was praying at the end of this, uh, right before his death, right before his arrest. He was in the upper room, and uh, he was praying for himself and his disciples in John 17. We studied that over the summer months with those that were here on Wednesday night. And in, in verse 6 of that chapter, Jesus says to his father, I have manifested your name to the people in who you have given me out of the world. You gave them to me. And then listen to what he says. They have kept your word. When we come to faith in Jesus Christ, God expects us to keep his word, to be obedient in our faith to the truth of the gospel. And when we do, we start building our uh, foundation on the cornerstone, which is Jesus Christ. Anything else will fail. Anything else will fall. A true disciple can face the storms of life, when sickness comes, when suffering comes, when disappointment comes, when accidents come, when you are mistreated in some way, even when sin comes. A true disciple of Jesus Christ who has built their foundation on him as, his, as him as cornerstone can stand firm and will not be shaken. Didn't say you would like what you're facing, but I'm saying that your faith will not be shaken. Pastor Scott Willis and his wife Janet, um, they lived outside of Chicago, Illinois, and they were going to uh, go to uh, Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And they buckled six of their nine kids in their minivan this day, and they had no idea what that day, the horror of that day, as it would unfold. They were on I-94 going into Milwaukee, and they ran over a piece of metal with their minivan. That metal kicked up, and it punctured the gas tank, and it started a fire. Their van became engulfed in flames. By the time that it came to a halt, Scott and Janet, jumped out of their doors, but they could not reach their six kids. And all six kids perished in the van. Now, you would think, and rightfully so, uh, your mind would go, is, oh, if that was me, I'd wonder where God was in all of this. You know, six of the nine children had perished. And so as Janet saw the van engulfed in flames, she began to holler, no, no, no. I probably would have done the same. But as they later were in a news conference outside of the hospital, 
This is what Janet said. She said, as I stood there screaming, looking at the van engulfed in flames, Scott tapped me on the shoulder. And he said, honey, this is what we have been preparing for. And he was right. We had prepared our children for the Lord. We had prepared ourselves for whatever storm came along. Later in the hospital room, Janet said they were watching videos as they were being cared for for their burns of their kids reading scripture in church, their kids that had proclaimed Jesus Christ as Lord. And she said, I realized that Scott was right. They had been prepared. We had been prepared for this time. And their testimony was such that God demonstrates his love towards us and towards our family, Scott said, that there was no question that God was with us in the storm, even a storm that took our children because our children were with the Lord. Could we sustain in any way a storm of such with our faith. A disciple of Jesus Christ obeys him, makes him the foundation on which we build our faith, on which we build our trust. On him we trust that in all things, at all times, he is going to be with us. Jesus said in that verse 49, the one who hears and does not do what I say is like the builder who builds his house on the ground. The false disciple is one that does not take action. The false disciple is one that does not build on the word of God. The false disciple is one who listens to all that pervades in a secular society. The false disciple is one that says, I belong to Jesus, looks the same on the outside. But when you start looking on the inside, there is no foundation. There is no hold. There is nothing attached to Jesus Christ, the claims of being Christian or a Having Christianity of faith is not there because when the storms come, they do not obey. When Jesus calls, they do not obey. When Jesus asks for action, they do not obey. And then that verse from John, whoever says that they know Jesus but does not, keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in them. The false disciple has built their spiritual life on the ground with no foundation. And that is when the Matthew text comes into play. When Jesus looks at that person that says, didn't I cast out demons in your name? Didn't I act in your name? And Jesus says to them, Depart from me, I did not know you, you lawless one. I want to tell you about this home that Warren and Pat Adams had built that stood in Hurricane Ike. This is actually a rebuilt home because you see, Earlier, three years earlier, Hurricane Rita had come through and it had destroyed the home that they had built on the island, on the peninsula. And they loved being on the beach. And as they contemplated about building a new house, they said, if we're going to build again, certainly hurricanes are going to come again to Texas. What are we going to do? And they sought out someone that could build a foundation that said, I don't know that I can guarantee it, but I'm pretty sure if we build down deep enough, 
if we put uh, 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 oversized columns, if we do this, that, and the other on the bedrock, on the, the foundation that's rock, this house will stand. And that's the house you saw. That was the foundation that was built on the rock. And their house, out of the houses on the peninsula, stood. Jesus is the bedrock in which we build on. He is our cornerstone. He is the one that, that takes everything. When we think of the keystone up that's on top that is put in place. Yesterday I used an illustration and showed the building of the St. Louis, the Gateway Arch. And if you look at that archway, the very last piece that was put in was the keystone. And they had to separate and put a bar across as they built up because the pressure of each of those columns as they began to curve and go, the engineer said, if we did not build something to hold them until the uh, keystone was put into place, they would collapse. You see, the keystone held the weight of the two columns as they came together. Jesus is not only our foundation, but he's the one that we can fall on. He's the one that we can be sure is there as we go through the storms of life. He gives us strength in the times that we need it most. So how do we build this foundation on Jesus Christ? How do we get strength as a, a capstone in Jesus Christ? How do we have um, this the keystone and the capstone that gives us strength is through prayer, worship, and God's Word. If those aren't prevalent in your life, then you have shaky faith. And you can say, Marty, you're judging me. I'm just telling you what the Word says. If you haven't, if you aren't in God's Word, your foundation is shaky at best. If you aren't spending time in prayer, your foundation is shaky at best. If you aren't worshiping with the community, the body of Christ, if you forsake the assembly of the community, the body of Christ, as Hebrew says, uh, we're, we are going to have a shaky foundation. We need to build a foundation that is firm and that is only found in Jesus Christ. So I want to share just a closing illustration to kind of make uh, this point. The story of two hikers, and they were going up the mountain and um, they were going to hike up and then hike down the other side. As they were ascending the mountain, fog rolled in. And they realized that they had to get off of that mountain before darkness or they were not going to be able to find their way down. They didn't have flashlights or any uh, guidance uh, mechanism. And so they were pushing on, pressing on, trying to find a way off of the mountain in the fog. As the fog settled in and as they were walking, the ground below them gave way. And they slid down the side of the mountain several feet. And all of a sudden, they came to a stop. And neither one of them were injured. And they were on this ledge that stuck out from the mountain. As they began to catch themselves kind of uh, get oriented of what had happened and that they were both okay, the fog began to lift. And they noticed that not only were they standing on the ledge where they had stopped, but on out about six to eight feet from them on the side of the mountain were two other ledges, the outcrops, rocks that were outcrops from the mountain. And so they began to look at that, and they saw that from each of those outcrop rocks, there was a path that led down the mountain. And so they began to think, hey, if we can jump to one of these ledges, then we can be safe going down the mountain. The problem was this. One of them said, I think the one on the left 
is the one that we need to, to jump to. That looks the most secure. And the other guy said, no, 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 no. The one on the right, the one on the right is the one that looks the most secure. That's the one that we should jump to. And they began to debate which way to jump. Well, guess what happened? They both followed their own guess. And folks, it was a guess. Because neither one of them knew if either of the ledges were secure. So at the same time, they both jumped. One of the hikers jumped to the ledge he thought would be secure, and it gave way, and he plunged down the side of the mountain to his death. The other hiker jumped, and his ledge stood firm, and he hiked down the mountain to safety. Now, the purpose of the illustration is not to say, oh, one was right and one was wrong in picking which ledge. You see, neither one of them knew if the ledge was going to be secure. Neither one of them knew. You see, they could only speculate what they saw. Too often we speculate. We think that we've got the truth or that someone else that's telling us the truth has it all figured out. And I can tell you that there is only one truth that you can depend on and stand on, and that is Jesus Christ and his word. You say, well, Marty, that's very narrow. Um, you know, you are uh, narrowing it down that that is the only way. And because I believe that all Scripture is inspired by God and I believe that all Scripture is God's truth, then you can't go anywhere else than to Jesus' word. And if Jesus is our cornerstone in which we build our foundation, then we have to believe when he says in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. You see, that's not speculation. That's just specific truth. These hikers speculated. If you start speculating on what is going to be good for you when it comes to your spiritual life, you're going to find that when the storms come, it's going to be difficult to stand because the foundation is only found in Jesus Christ. The other verse that's up there is from 1 Corinthians, the third chapter. And in this chapter, Paul is talking about to the church of Corinth, Foundations for living. You ought to read chapter 3 today to get a sense of that. But verse 11 is very interesting. Verse 11 says, For no man can lay a foundation other than the one which has been laid, which is Jesus Christ. You see, there's not another foundation to stand on when it comes to our spiritual life. Not only did Jesus say that he was the way, Paul, in his teaching to the church, the scripture that has been given to us is that Jesus is the way. He is the foundation that we place on not only our faith and trust on, but we build our life on. You see, the choice is clear. Those who follow the blueprint of false teachers foolishly build their house with no foundation. They try to build it with human achievement, with their own skills, with their own logic, and ultimately the house will be, their spiritual house will be swept away and will have divine judgment. But those who build their house 
on the foundation of the Lord Jesus Christ, the solid rock, their house will stand. Their spiritual walk will be secure. We sang just a few minutes ago, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. On Christ the solid, I stand. So the question I want to leave you with this morning is this. On what foundation have you built your spiritual house? Let's pray. Father, thank you for your son Jesus Christ, who not only left heaven and came to earth, deity and humanness in one, who lived, died, and was raised. And Father, who has given us grace and mercy in his name for all who would believe. Father, if our foundation is on anything else other than your Son, it's going to be shaky at best. Father, we pray this morning that as if there's anyone in this room that has put their faith in anything else other than your Son, has built their spiritual house on anything else than the foundation of Jesus Christ, we pray this morning, Father, that we would acknowledge you as Lord. Why do you call me Lord, Lord? Don't do what I say, Jesus says, as he closes out this sermon. Father, may our house be built on the solid rock and then be rock solid in all things. May it be so, Father. We pray this in your name. Amen.